Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Our next presenter is going to be talking about the problem with capitalism. Live from the US, he is the author of Patterning Instinct and Web of Meaning, and the founder of the Lyology Institute. The Guardian has described him as one of the greatest thinkers of our age. He continues to write topical articles exploring the deeper patterns of political and cultural developments. As questions arise from anyone in the room, do key it in into the chat box to be addressed during the Q&A at the end. I now present, ladies and gentlemen, Jeremy Lent. Okay, well, thank you so much, David, for that introduction. Very and welcome. Um, Yes, yeah, so I'm looking forward to sharing <coughs> these thoughts with you today. Um, and as David said, <coughs> the title of this presentation um, is called The Problem with Capitalism. And I um, just want to give you a warning up front. Um, pe some people might find some of the topics I raise fairly challenging and maybe even at odds with some of the themes that are there and that are expressed throughout th this conference. So I invite you to follow me on this um, uh, on this discussion today. And so I believe, yes, I just wanted to make sure the, the slides were available there. Um, so <clears throat> as we say, the, the, the presentation is called The Problem with Capitalism. And basically what I'm going to be taking us through is some of these phrases <clears throat> that many of you might be not just familiar with, but feel very energized by and feel good about like sustainable development or green growth or stakeholder capitalism or conscious capitalism, I'm <clears throat> going to be suggesting are actually merely uh, like a veneer that's covering up what is really an expired like ideology. Um, <clears throat> and to understand that better, we need to look at the underlying values of what our global growth-based economy um, are based on because they're basically unsustainable values. And um, they're things like keep growing at all costs, maximize shareholder value, um, <clears throat> seeing material consumption as basically like a proxy of human welfare. And um, seeing non-human nature as really nothing other than a resource to exploit. <clears throat> so to get a better understanding of where I'm coming from, I would like to begin um, starting kind of at the very beginning, if you will, like the big picture. And here's the earth in space, our only home, and the only place that we know of right now where life exists anywhere in the universe. And on this beautiful planet, <clears throat> life actually first emerged billions of years ago. And <clears throat> it evolved as incredible rich abundance, but it's only been the last 100,000 years or so that one particular species arose that had the power to impact the very nature of life itself on this planet. And so we need to ask ourselves, how have we been doing? And the answer, as I think everyone in this conference is aware, is we're doing a terrible job, actually. Um, we're only too familiar now with these harbingers of a daunting future, like wildfires, <coughs> floods, um, and droughts, like all around the world that are, uh, of course, rising because of this climate emergency that we're facing. And the frightening thing, of course, is that these harbingers are only the beginning of something, of, of an unfolding catastrophe that we're moving towards. And at the moment, yeah, maybe we're headed for as much as three degrees plus of global heating this century, which scientists say would be catastrophic. But even if we were able to shift that drastically, according to some of the more aggressive um, so, uh, I, proposals put by nations that have not yet been met, it would still be more like a prescription for disaster based on what scientists are telling us because of these amplifying feedbacks that exist in the climate. But here's the thing. Even if we could somehow find a magic bullet that just magically like fixed our entire climate emergency, we'd still need to recognize that climate and the climate disaster itself is just a symptom of an Eva deeper underlying problem, which is the vast ecological destruction that we're causing across the board. The statistics um, are vast all around that. I'll just give you a few basic ones to give you a feel. Um, since 1970 alone, there's been a 68% decline in animal populations worldwide. We're now looking at 
um, the beginning of the sixth great extinction of species since life began on Earth billions of years ago. Only this is the first one caused by one particular species, ourselves. And we're looking at all this, certainly, the, the virtual annihilation of coral reefs worldwide this century. And by the UN's own forecasts, 95% of Earth's land will be degraded by 2050. But of all these statistics, the one that personally blows my mind the most is this one, <clears throat> that by 2050, at current rates, <clears throat> there will be more plastic by weight in the ocean than fish. Because of <clears throat> these kinds of dynamics, many scientists are calling out to tell us that we're rapidly heading for a precipice. Some of you may be familiar with the work of Johann Rockström and his team, who over the last few years has developed a model of what they, they call a safe operating space for humanity, uh, defining nine different planetary boundaries for that operating space. We've already blown through five of those nine boundaries. And as a result of that, these are the kind of things scientists who study <clears throat> the Earth system are saying, soon it'll be too late to shift course away from our failing trajectory, that there's a very big risk that we will end our civilization. And here's the ex-UN Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, um, telling the world leaders, it is a global suicide pact that we're on right now. Now, many people look <clears throat> at these data and they say, okay, we've got that, <clears throat> but what about green growth? What we need to do is separate out growth in our economy and our GDP from material usage using technology. But <clears throat> sadly, <clears throat> that green growth strategy <clears throat> has been shown not to be credible. In fact, there is no empirical evidence for what's known as absolute decoupling between GDP and raw material consumption. And as you can see by this slide, um, they basically track each other and have been for the last um, two to three decades and more. Now, I know that the theme of this conference is looking at the lessons of the past. And so what I'd like to do is spend a moment or two <clears throat> looking at where this system of growth-based global capitalism came from. It basically emerged <clears throat> with a modern worldview <clears throat> that first really um, came to being in 17th century Europe, so hundreds of years ago. And with that modern worldview, people began to see nature as a resource and other people who were non-Europeans basically also as resources. And that led to hundreds of years of behaviors of extraction from nature and essentially exploitation of other um, non-white Europeans, leading to colonialism and <clears throat> leading to this ecological abuse that we see right now. And those are the sources of global capitalism that we experience today. And global capitalism now has this extractive directive the overriding requirements of it are to monetize everything as fast as possible, to turn humans into basically conditioned consumers and to exploit every available resource on the earth. And to get an un a better understanding <clears throat> of how this dynamic works, I want to spend a moment or two on what's known as the Jevons paradox. This is <clears throat> an insight got developed by the 19th century British economist called William Stanley Jevons. And he was studying <clears throat> the impact of James Watt's steam engine invention some decades earlier. And the paradox was that the steam engine greatly improved the efficiency of coal powered engines and, and therefore decreased the amount of coal required for any particular application. And yet it paradoxically caused a dramatic increase in coal consumption in the decades that followed. And what has been found is that anywhere around the world, basically any technological innovation follows this kind of Jevons paradox. A cotton gin in the United States increased the productivity of every slave working on the plantations 25 times. But rather than leading to a decrease in slave population, it led to a five-fold increase in slave population. More recently, automobile fuel efficiency improvements have been shown to actually increase the number of miles traveled. And that's because what we see here is this Jevons paradox is not even a paradox at all, but is basically a structural characteristic of capitalism. 
<clears throat> and then if we look at how capitalism is manifested in the world, of course, we know that it's <clears throat> primarily through the limited liability corporation, which <clears throat> was invented right around the same time as that modern worldview that we looked at earlier with companies like the East India Company. And they were formed <clears throat> to encourage wealthy Europeans to invest in ventures to exploit the resources of overseas colonies and structure to give investors all the upside if things went well, but limit the downside if things went wrong. And that created what, was, <clears throat> what has become known as moral hazard, which it means an incentive to take inappropriate risks because the upside is greater than the downside. And in fact, in England, after a series of frauds, market crashes, corporations were banned in 1720. But then decades later, with the Industrial Revolution generated demand for them again. And of course, <clears throat> what we now know over the last couple of centuries is that corporations now have come to dominate the world. In fact, of the world's large, 100 largest economies right now, 69 of them are not countries, but transnational corporations. And these corporations dominate the globe. And all around the world, nations and municipalities compete against each other to attract corporate investment that they need. Um, and they're willing to weaken or eliminate their taxes, regulations, worker protections, or environmental protection, just so they can attract these companies. And in fact, and these boundaries uh, between executives and governments have become um, basically so blurred as to become virtually non-existent. And we see this in virtually every major industry across the world, this total dominance of these corporations. Now, maybe that wouldn't be so bad if the ultimate value of corporations was to increase um, true human welfare <clears throat> on a flourishing planet. But in fact, the opposite is true. Corporations are legally bound to pursue one value above all others, maximizing shareholder profits. <clears throat> and they, as a result of that, quite appropriately for what they're bound to do, they have a single-minded obsession with profit at the expense of anything else. As, um, as we know, in many jurisdictions, including um, where I live in the United States, corporations have legal personhood with free license to influence elections. Um, but if corporations were really persons and they were being analyzed by a psychologist, the rather terrifying result that a psychologist would find looking at their characteristics is if they were human persons, they'd be called a psychopath. So we're in this strange and rather terrifying predicament that the future of human welfare and the earth is basically being controlled by what may be thought of as psychopathic corporations. And, and with these corporations and this system of capitalism is based on perpetual growth. As you all know, um, the, um, the stock market price of any um, of the companies traded on the stock market is based on a price to earnings ratio, which is based on assumptions about the growth in the earnings of that company. Not the current earnings, but the growth over years to come. And, and just the last couple of weeks has shown, as we all know only too well, what happens when the expectations of that growth even begins to fall to just a little bit. We deal with significant declines in stock markets. Um, but if we look back all the way from the Second World War to right now, we see that with, some, with a few fluctuations, there's been this massive growth, not just in the um, in corporate profits, but in basically every one of those elements of production that corporations need in order to keep growing. And when mainstream economists look at the expectations for the next few decades, they expect global production with all the destruction already been caused to triple by 2060, which is of course why <clears throat> the scientists are calling out that we're rapidly heading for a precipice. So it is important to ask ourselves, is it possible that our civilization is headed for collapse on this trajectory? Well, I believe, and what I'm sharing with you is that we have a choice ahead of us. <clears throat> we could maintain the underlying values of this system right now that will lead to what <clears throat> um, ecological scientists call overshoot, leading to ecological collapse and the potential even for civilizational collapse. Or, 
we could begin to change the underlying values of our system, leading to more like a cultural transformation around the world, um, which could lead to transformed um, economy and society, and an, an economic transformation, which some people call an ecological civilization. And let me show you what I mean when I talk about values. We looked at the underlying values <clears throat> of our global economy right now. When I talk about a transformation values, I'm talking about things like moving to an emphasis on the quality of life rather than material possessions, prioritizing progress in quality, not quantity, basing our choices, political, social, and economic on a sense of our shared humanity and building civilization's future on the basis of symbiosis with the living earth where the flourishing of the natural world is a foundational principle. And let me leave you with just a couple of examples of what that transformation in values might mean for um, economics and, and for the world uh, the, this conference is looking at. For example, <clears throat> GDP is often viewed um, as this kind of sign of how successful capitalism has been. And this graph is sometimes rolled out to show how the, this explosion in GDP globally in the last century has been <clears throat> so much benefit for the world. But we need to recognize that GDP simply measures the rate at which society is transforming nature and human activity into the monetary economy, regardless of the ensuing quality of life. It actually fails to distinguish between activities that promote welfare and those that reduce it. So to give you some examples of this, <clears throat> GDP um, right now goes up when things happen like an oil spill or a terminal cancer patient is good for GDP, or even a hurricane, because in every one of these cases, they increase the, the um, need and, and the, the pull on the monetary economy. What's bad for GDP are things like people growing a vegetable garden in their backyard to feed themselves and their neighbors, or somebody deciding to bicycle to work rather than drive <clears throat> and use as a part of the monetary economy. Now, and for this reason, people have, um, are talking about replacing GDP to measure national success with other indicators. One of them is called the Genuine Progress Indicator, which factors in negatives like income inequality, pollution or crime, and positives like volunteer and household work and education. And when these people have studied, um, <clears throat> like applying that genuine progress historically, looking since the Second World War, what they found is while GDP has continued to go up steadily and, and massively, genuine progress or social welfare has actually been declining since 1978. I'll leave you with one more example of what this shift in values could mean. Right, <clears throat> the idea would be um, corporations, for example, existing for humanity rather than shareholder returns. Many of you will be familiar with the notion of benefit corporations or B Corp certifications where companies can choose to shift their charters to consider the impact of their decisions on workers, customers, suppliers, the community environment. Um, unfortunately, this has had virtually no impact on our system as a whole because it's a choice. And virtually every large corporation chooses not to um, change their charter. And even if one did, then they would no longer be on a level playing field with other companies that would not have to be caring about those things. So there's this, I, the idea is to have a triple bottom line required for corporate charters with a charter renewal every few years based on the discretion of a panel that determines if they've met not just a bottom line of profit, but also people and planets. So corporations would be subject not just to financial bankruptcy if things went wrong, but social or environmental bankruptcy. So you can imagine how this would affect decisions that are made and fundamentally shift the character of the corporation. Say a company is looking at um, investing in a copper mine in some place. Right now, with our current situation, they're forced to maximize shareholder value. There's only one way to decide, exploit it if it's profitable. Um, if they didn't exploit it, the share price would decline. They might be sued by shareholders. The mine would just be acquired by a more ruthless competitor. If there was a triple bottom line requirement, they'd have to employ balanced decision-making, looking at things like the risk of excessive pollution um, and what's um, important for the community. And they'd need to optimize for all three bottom lines. Those are the kind of ideas <clears throat> that could lead towards what are, uh, people are calling an ecological civilization, a transformation 
in the basis of our global civilization from one that's wealth-based to one that's life-based. <clears throat> Imagine a global cultural and economic system that was actually promoting sustainable flourishing for humans and earth. And in, if enough of us could do that, <clears throat> then maybe we could avoid what this cartoon posits at some, <clears throat> um, at some horrible scenario in the future. For <clears throat> us, here's an executive saying to the younger people, yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. Let's avoid that future and let's move towards one that could truly be life affirming. So thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Jeremy, for addressing the elephant in the room <laughs> and highlighting the existential crisis, but also encouraging our audience to explore pathways towards a life affirming mm. future. We have some audience questions for you actually. So as you have mentioned, the negative consequences of current growth strategies are escalating. What are some of the most vital and urgent things small business owners should focus on in response to this? Well, <clears throat> I think that uh, one thing that a small business owner can do <clears throat> is look at actually adopting <clears throat> some of those voluntary uh, triple bottom line choices that we've just been talking about. Because while the system change would require all the, the triple bottom line to be required for everybody, it is something that uh, not just can be done, but have been shown to be actually highly profitable. It doesn't have to come at the expense of profits, because when your workers are feeling good about what they're doing, and when customers are feeling good about the products they're, uh, they're buying, it can lead to positive and incremental improvement across the board. So that's absolutely something that I would encourage people to do. And I want to emphasize that just because I'm focusing this, this presentation on the systems change required, that doesn't mean that the, in, the changes made by small business owners, that each of us incrementally are irrelevant. They all move us towards this possibility of a greater transformation. Thank you, Jeremy. But with capitalism and consumerism so ingrained in humanity, who has the biggest role to play in the transformation of our values? Consumers, companies, or the government? Well, I would argue none of those, um, but each of us um, as individuals, as part of groups and as part of our community. And so <clears throat> I'm specifically saying not consumers, because really even that word consumer is this label put by our global capitalist system on us as humans. So we're no longer human beings with our choices um, as to what to do with our lives, but we are predefined as consumers. But when each of us realizes actually we're full human beings, we can be engaged, not just <clears throat> in um, trying to do something right in the work we're doing, but actually engaged in this kind of systems change, engaged in, in helping those in the community around us that are actually working on trying to actually transform what they're doing in, in deeper ways and working on some of the global political shifts. It's not enough just to focus on what we're doing individually or what I'm doing in, within my company, but to actually look at these global systemic shifts and get engaged at multiple levels of engagement once we really see the incredible um, disaster that is pending unless we begin to uh, actually as groups around the world work together to change it. Thank you for your time, Jeremy, and thank you for defining and outlining things for us today. Uh, it was a pleasure having you. We hope to have you back next year or possibly live in person as well. Th thank you very much. And, uh, and thank you for listening to my perspective today. I very much appreciate it. Fantastic. That. Thank you, Jeremy. Take care. We know how to connect with Malaysians better than anyone else. The one from Alostar to the ones in Tawau, the Babas, the Nyonyas, the Teochus to the traditional Sikhs, those living in the Bangsa bubble, the wannabe successful SMEs, the drama loving Miri moms, to the YouTubers in Mentaka, even those who wish to be thin again and those who wish to be young again. We know how to connect with Malaysians better than anyone else. 
That's because we speak to them through the nation's widest array of touch points, reaching 98% of Malaysian households on the air, through news and content, online and on ground, so that brand builders, big and small, reach the Malaysians they need. And more, we're here to connect you to Malaysians better than anyone else. It's our business. Omnia.